Hello and welcome to You So You. My name's Zoe and this is my channel all about the crafty bits and pieces I get up to. I knit, I sew, I spin on a drop spindle, I dabble in weaving from time to time and anything else that takes my crafty fancy. And this week we are talking about Dorset buttons. So grab a brew, put your feet up and let's get started. Welcome back to any returning viewers and to any new viewers, a very warm welcome to you. Now, as I mentioned in the opening to this video, this week we are talking about Dorset buttons. Now, if you follow my Instagram, you'll have seen fairly recently that I've had a go at making some Dorset buttons myself. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to show you how I was getting on with those and how I'm actually going about doing them. I actually started by getting a couple of kits for the Dorset buttons so that I had the instructions to go with them. I got one kit from Henry's Buttons, which uh, focuses on the cartwheel style of Dorset Buttons, uh, which is the, probably the most recognisable style. Um, and that came with five rings in three different sizes, so two tiny, two small, and one a bit bigger. Um, and two colours of DMC thread. I chose Ecru. Um, so you get the, the white thread and I got Ecru, you can get, you get a second colour with it as well. Um, ordered, I ordered that through Etsy, through the Henry's Button Shop on Etsy, but they do have their own website. I believe they are only selling through Etsy though. Um, so you get your rings, your thread, your instructions and a needle. And a little bit of history about the Dorset Buttons themselves, so more on that in a moment. The other kit that I got was from Beaker Buttons. And that kit comes with some hand dyed yarn. Um, I went for a plant based yarn. I chose the Fox colourway. Uh, Beaker Buttons do sell through their website directly. Um, and in their kit, you get 10 rings and the instructions for five different designs of buttons. I've made up three so far, as in three of the designs. I've got six buttons made. Um, so, this is the cartwheel design. This is the style that I think most people will recognise. Um, as a Dorset button. So that was the first one that I did. And I have put out two of the other signs, but I just realised I can't remember what they're called, so I'm just going to get the instructions out. So yeah, you get this lovely booklet with um, the Beaker Buttons kit, and it's got a little bit of information on the back. And yeah, if you do a bit of Googling on, on Dorset buttons, you can find all sorts of stuff that tells you about them, but a lot of them are sort of the same basic information. So there's only so much that's known. So yeah. So that first style was the uh, cartwheel. It's sometimes called the Blandford cartwheel from what I can find and it's sometimes called a crosswheel. But as I say that's the the most recognizable Dorset button style. And the next one that I did was called a Yarrow button. This is the one that I really couldn't remember the name of because it doesn't really stick in the mind. Um, so this is the Yarrow style of button. So it starts off the same as the cartwheel, but um, yeah, goes a little bit different after a while. Um, which is essentially the way Dorset buttons work for, for this style of Dorset button, um, the ring style. Because uh, there are four different types of uh, Dorset buttons, apparently. Uh, there's a whole rabbit hole to to dive down with these things um, and the other style that I've made up so far are called da it's called the daisy chain button so again you start off like the cartwheel and um, but then the the last couple of rounds you're um, basically imitating the daisy chain embroidery stitch around the outside of the button so those are the ones I've made up so far um, in this kit, I've still got a flower design to try and a uh, Templar Cross style to try. Um, it takes me a little under an hour to get each button done at that size um, with the yarn that came with that kit. Um, which, for me, for somebody who's not used to doing it, is not bad. Um, but if we think about the origins of the Dorset button, which is, as I said, there is information out there, but it's it's 
non-massive amount of information that I've been able to come across so far in my googling. Um, I may need to go further down that rabbit hole and actually like talk to people in the know and museums and stuff. But I'm just going to grab my notes um, to sort of summarise the history of Dorset buttons because they are, it's a specifically local industry in the UK. Dorset is a, a county in the south of the country. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a local cottage industry. Um, it's about 400 years ago now that it, that it started um, from, from what people can, can tell. So this year is, is being recognised as the 400th anniversary of the Dorset Button. So the, the whole company started with this soldier from the Cotswolds who married a local girl and settled in Shaftesbury in Dorset. Uh, he's called a Abraham Case and he seems to have married this girl and settled in Shaftesbury in 1622 and set up the Dorset Button Company. Um, so that's why, well the, the Dorset Button industry I should say, um, I don't think it was a specific company, it's referred to as industry on the sources that I found so far. Um, I'm not linking them down below because it's mostly from like the, the, the websites of the companies that I've bought the kits from and like general googling. Um, so it's not hugely academic resources that I'm using at the moment. Um, so yeah, so he started the Dorset Button industry and apparently there were four types of uh, buttons that he came up with. Um, one of them is called the high top, which was, from what they what I can come across, seems to have been the first style. Um, I will put pictures up of the, the different types that I can find uh, somewhere on the screen for you and I'll, I'll label them because um, I don't know all the names. Um, but the the ring type that I've been making here, that's that's what's recognised these days as a Dorset button. Um, so, 1622, he set up this industry, employs local people to, to make the buttons. They're all made by hand because this is pre-industry, um, or pre-industrial revolution, really. Um, but I mean only just, because by the end of the 1700s, uh, there are about 4,000 people men, women and children, employed in the Dorset button industry, all making buttons by hand. Um, they're coded by the colour of cardboard that they're put on to say what standard they are. Um, and the amount of buttons these people are churning out is ridiculous. A good worker is apparently able to produce seven dozen, that's 84, buttons in a day takes me about 50 minutes to do one. I mean, to be fair, they were probably doing smaller ones than this. Um, but still, that, that, that's a lot in a day. So 84 buttons a day. <laughs> um, I think the average that I came across, I came across one figure that in a week they were doing like 140 odd. Um, which doesn't seem like 84 in a day to me, but... Uh, if 84 is the good worker and 140 is the average, I suppose that sort of makes, makes sense. Okay, so yeah, early 1800s, so moving into the 19th century, that's when things started to, to tail off with the Dorset button industry because there was an automatic, well I say automatic, there was a button machine made, uh, in, introduced in the early 1800s. Uh, so the Industrial Revolution, mechanised methods of making stuff, cottage industries start to die out. Um, and that, that's pretty much the same in a lot of industries across the UK with the rise of the industrial revolution and, and uh, industrialisation of processes. Um, there were all sorts of riots and things from farmers and factory workers and what have you trying to basically preserve their jobs because these machines were taking over. Okay, so what I thought I would do is show you a little bit of footage of me making one of these cartwheel buttons. Um, I'm going to use the... Henry's button kit for this, which I haven't started yet. Um, so the things that you need to make a Dorset button of the like ring type, you need a closed metal or plastic ring. Um, I'm using metal ones because that's what in my kits. Um, but yeah, it needs to be a closed ring. A, a jump ring type thing isn't going to work because it's open and everything will fall off it. Um, so yeah, closed ring. Yarn or thread of some description, and you're going to need quite a long length. Unlike with embroidery, where you like 
keep your length fairly short so you don't get tangled. With a dorset button you really want to try and get the whole button done with the same piece of thread. So for these ones with the, the yarn that came with them it's about two to three meters I'm finding is working for me. Um, so if I do that, uh, so I'll cut, cut the length of the thread and um, then obviously you'll need a needle. So close ring, thread or yarn, needle, scissors. That's it, that's all you need. So I'll um, shift the camera around and uh, get some footage of me having a go and making a cutwheel style dorset button. Okay, so I've threaded my needle with about three metres of thread and I've um, pulled it so that I've only got a little bit beyond the tail. So my, my tail's coming to there and I've only got a bit of thread left. That's just to, to make it a little bit more manageable as I'm working. The first thing that I need to do is to cover the, the ring. And we do this using blanket stitch. Um, the term in dorset buttons for covering the ring is casting. So that's the first stage. So you can knot the, uh, the thread onto the ring. Um, in fact, the instructions that I have do say to tie it on. But um, a lot of the videos that I've watched, they didn't. So... You're going to cover up the tail as you're working. I haven't knotted it, I'm just holding the tail in place. I'm going to go all the way around the ring with blanket stitch, I'm covering that up as I go. So um, I'm going to bring the needle through the ring first and then under this loop that I've got over my finger. And I'm going to pull that tight. And then I'm going to repeat. So I'm going to get the loop over my finger. And under that loop. Making sure that it's encasing that tail as I work. And I'm just going to go all the way around in the same manner. Uh, this is the slowest part of the process, um, I find. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a straightforward process. It just takes a bit of time, particularly when you're looking at a ring this size. <coughs> Obviously I don't want to rush it particularly because I don't want to get a tangle. Um, you can see I've got a few stitches there covering the ring. So I'm going to keep going like that all the way around. And when I've covered up enough of this tail that I'm happy it's not going to go anywhere, I'll snip it off. And yeah, I'll just keep going all the way around the ring with blanket stitch. And I'll come back to you in a bit when that's done. Okay, so I've finished casting, so the, the ring is completely covered with blanket stitches. So that's stage one done. It's a four stage process essentially. Um, so the next stage is called slicking, and I'm just going to roll around these little bumps that the blanket stitch creates so that they're all sitting on the inside of the ring. This is the quickest stage. Um, so you just try and make the outside of the ring nice and smooth. I mean, clearly, when you're making a dorset button, the size of the, the ring dictates the size of the button. Okay, so that is slicking done. All the bumps are now sitting inside the ring out of the way. And I've got a nice smooth edge along the outside. Just see a little bit of the metal peeking through there, but this particular ring wasn't 100% smooth, um, so it's just where there's a lump in the ring that it's sticking through. Um, but yeah, you want to try and avoid having the ring show through if you can. So the next step is what's called laying, which is where we're going to wrap the thread 
under the ring and over the top to make the spokes. For the cross wheel, the cartwheel design, we're going to need 10 spokes, so we're going to need to wrap it around five times. And um, that'll give us 10 spokes in total. So I'm going to bring it underneath the bottom of the ring and then up directly opposite. Then I'm going to rotate it round. So that's two, that's three, that's four, and that's five, and they're not particularly even, so I'm going to go back and try again. <laughs> it's a little bit of trial and error I've found with this, and because I haven't done very many, um, I'm still working it out, so in terms of where the spokes need to sit. So that's one, that's two. This is better. Three, four, and five. So they're fairly even. They're not perfect, but it's handmade, so yeah. Okay, so now we need to secure the spokes in the middle. If you can see the underneath spokes, are not all central, but the top spokes are. So this is going to fix that. So I'm going to bring my needle up through. I'm just looking for the space where the spokes are all going to be caught, pretty much, or as many as possible. So we're going to bring the needle up through from the bottom. Oh, getting a few tangles in my thread. I'll deal with that in a minute. And then I'm going to bring it back down again, directly opposite, and pull it tight. And then I'm just going to rotate the ring round a little bit more and repeat that to make a little cross stitch in the middle of my ring. And pull it nice and tight. Now it's not perfectly central but again I'm still quite new to this so it will get better with time. Um, and you can kind of manipulate it a little bit with your needle. Um, and I mean, as as I put this, the next stage on, it's going to help as well. So the third stage is called rounding. So we're basically going to be back stitching in a spiral across the spokes. Um, so the rounding stage is where you get the different designs coming in. So this one, the rounding process changes part way through, this one it changes at the end. Uh, so that's what creates the designs, but we're sticking with this first one. So we're going to need to bring the needle up from the back. And then we're going to go anti-clockwise across two spokes. So across two. And then we're going to bring it up Going back on ourselves, one. So anti clockwise, two, clockwise, one. And again, this one takes a little bit of time, not as much time as uh, going around the, the ring in the first place, but it does take a bit of time. And I'm just going to keep doing that um, across two, back one, to fill up the middle of this ring and I'll come back and uh, show you how I finish off at the end. Okay, I've noticed as I'm working around this that I made a little bit of an error. Um, as you can see, this is really, really smooth and not looking like the cartwheel because I'm doing my stitch the wrong way around. Um, so I'm going over the top for two and back for one. Whereas what I should be doing, if I flip it over, is going underneath for two and back for one. Um, so normally you'd be going anti-clockwise for two and um, clockwise for one, but because I messed up, um, I'm just going to do mine the other way around. As you can see, doing it that way, you get the spokes appearing. Um, whereas if you do it the way I was doing it, it's very, very flat. Um, but yeah, that, that's because I'm new to it. Um, it at the end of the day, it's not going to matter too much because 
I mean, it, it looks right on this side, um, so despite the centre being slightly off off centre, um, which you can sort of shift a little bit by pulling it around. Um, but yeah, by just by stitching it on this way around, it'll be fine. Uh, but yeah, whoops. Um, the stitch that I was doing, going over the top two and back one, is actually the stitch you do halfway through rounding on this one uh, to get the yarrow, um, which because it's got that flat bit there and then spokes in the middle. Um, so yeah, I just got a bit muddled up, but that's okay, because uh, we all learn, and at the end of the day, I've still got a button that is that will be functional, and that looks good, so yeah, not a problem. Uh, so I'm just going to continue doing the last few rounds here. Uh, if I was going to be doing the daisy chain pattern, this would be about where I would uh, change the stitch to get that stitch done um, but yeah for your, your basic cartwheel crosswheel um, whichever name you want to use for it you just keep going round and round and round until your middle is as full up as, as full up as you want it to be um, I generally see these with the center completely full but apparently you can stop wherever so uh, yeah as you can see, I've gone through a good portion of my thread already, um, which is why having the, the long length of thread to begin with is, is helpful. You can add thread in part way through, and I have done that on one of uh, one of my original cartwheels, um, but it's better not to. So I'll get the last few rounds done, and then we'll finish the thread off. Uh, and this button will be ready to use. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I don't think I'm going to get another round done and still have enough thread left to finish off if I keep going. I mean, I could add a little bit more in, as I say, and do another round or two, but um, I'm actually okay with that like that. So to finish it off, um, I'm flip the button over to to the back, well, which, which should have been the front, but I messed up. Um, and I'm just going to weave the thread through the back a little bit, just to secure it. And I'm going to bring the thread through so that it ends up in the middle of the button. Um, and just leave a tail that way I've got something to sew it on to whatever it's going to go on um, and there we go finished dorset button done incorrectly but you get the idea so I hope you found that useful and interesting give me a like down below if you did and let me know in the comments if you're planning on making some dorset buttons yourself would you want to make big decorative ones? I've seen them used for brooches and earrings and necklaces and wall hangings, uh, so huge ones. Um, or would you want to make more sort of shirt sized petite buttons that you can sew onto garments? They are functional buttons and they are washable. After all, they're just a plastic or metal ring covered in thread or yarn. So yeah, absolutely washable. If you've enjoyed my company and would like to spend some more time with me, I aim to put a video out every weekend. Once a month it's a what I've been making the previous month video and the rest of the time I'm looking at various different crafts and techniques or occasionally just waffling at the camera. I usually manage to get that out on a Saturday and sometimes I'm organised enough to put it out on a Friday, other times technology lets me down and it comes up on a Sunday but it's usually a Saturday and always the weekend. Uh, but hit, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below so that you don't miss out next time I upload a video and I look forward to seeing you next time but until then happy crafting and bye bye for now.